All right, welcome to um, part one of Art and Mortality. We'll be looking at Baroque art in a couple of episodes and then we'll follow on to realism, um, romanticism, neoclassicism, all of which are movements that are really heavily focused on the theme of life and death and trying to um, portray these themes as best as possible during the time that uh, these artists lived. Uh, sorry about the, the bouncy bouncy of the screen. Today um, we're going to start with the Baroque movement as it's seen in Italy. Now the Baroque movement happened um, in the 16th and 17th centuries so uh, we're looking at artwork by Bernini in this first uh, chapter, um, specifically uh, the piazza that he built in front of St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican City, which you know is in Rome. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of images as I speak and hopefully what I say you can see within these images, but this was built in 1656 to 1667. So a brief history is that just before this in the 1500s Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr. who had a dream, the other Martin Luther, he started protests against the Catholic Church saying that they were corrupt um, and this was heightened by his stapling of the, his 95 thesis onto the Wittenberg Cathedral doors in 1517. So after this a lot of turmoil um, happened between the Catholics and Protestant churches um, and the Catholic Church was still unaware that um, the fact that they were spending so much money on creating these opulent churches and cathedrals meant that it was giving away the wrong signal to um, its followers. So there was a time in the 1600s where the Catholic Church took a back seat and was like, okay, we're going to stop spending so much money and start focusing more on the message that we want our followers to, to perceive from us. Um, and so you'll see there's a big difference in a lot of the artworks from the Baroque period. Some of those are really extravagant and opulent and others are quite pious and austere in what they're trying to say. So you'll get anything from a very lavish, elaborate gold leafed and bronze sculpture to something that's merely a still life portraying a loaf of bread and a glass of milk. Um, and this has a lot of political underpinnings as well as religious underpinnings. So starting with Benini, um, in the middle of the 17th century, okay, so mid 1600s, um, he's afforded the opportunity to create this uh, atrium. Okay, now the purpose of the atrium is to connect the spectator or the, the follower of the Catholic Church with the Basilica, St. Peter's Basilica, which we know has um, Michelangelo Sistine Chapel on one of the sides. Um, so his sole purpose here is to draw crowds in, but still leave them with a sense of awe. So what he does is, uh, but let me first tell you what already exists there. There's already an obelisk that um, the Romans brought from Egypt, and this is a sign of Christian triumph at the time. The other thing that exists is one water fountain that was designed by a, name, a guy named Moderna um, and what uh, Bernini eventually does is he adds another water fountain to add symmetry to the space. So I don't know if you can see in this image uh, the original water fountain here and the addition of Bernini's water fountain to create symmetry there. Okay now Bernini's design incorporates two colonnades. Now a colonnade is a group of um, columns that creates almost like a walkway, right? So he creates these two oval shaped colonnades. Each of them has a series of four columns repeated. So, um, you know, it's got three archways between them. Um, and these columns are all Doric design. So remember from when we did Greek architecture, you get Doric, Ionic, and later with the Romans, we've got Corinthian columns as well, which are very much more ornate and elaborate. Um, you'll also remember the term entesis, which is where a column is 
purposefully made to become narrower at the top so that when you stand on it the perspective looks even more pushed away so it looks like it's even um, taller than what it is um, you can see that from some of these images as well here of the columns that Bernini used okay the purpose of these two arms of the atrium or the the oval shaped colonnades is to really embrace the people so if you look here at this image of Pope Francis inauguration Pope Francis's inauguration in 2013 you can see how many people have gathered here but also how they seem to be embraced by the circular shape um, that Bernini designed okay the next work we look at is also Bernini <clears throat> um, this work is called the ecstasy of Saint Teresa and it was found in the Cornaro Chapel so is of Santa Maria della Vittoria in Rome. This was created in 1645 and lasted until 1652. That's how long it took him to make it. So he actually made this before he made um, the atrium in, or designed the atrium in front of St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, this sculpture really proves, well we call it a sculpture, but it's a little bit of a um, an interact or not an interactive artwork but an accumulation of all different types of art mediums because you'll see when I show you the bigger image that it includes sculptures to the left and right of it it's not just this one main sculpture that you're seeing in this image okay um, Bernini really loved the theatre um, and you can see this in his combination of architecture painting and sculpture this scene specifically refers to the conversion of Saint Teresa Saint Teresa from a Carmelite nun into a saint after the death of her father. Um, after her father died she was left seeing visions um, hearing voices and people described it to be in a trance-like state for much of her waking hours. While she was in this state she proclaimed to have felt a sharp pain in the heart uh, which she ascribed to the tip of an angel's arrow so hence we've got the angel with the arrow in his hand in this image um, apparently this arrow pierced her repeatedly and she she saw it as symbolizing divine love uh, she also describes this pain as a moment of ecstasy so so much pain but it really brought her ecstasy and made her swoon in anguish um, Bernini heightened the drama by placing this arrow in a niche um, sorry placing the sculpture in a niche a niche you'll remember is a cutaway into a wall um, I'll show you the the sculptural or the architectural elements of the sculpture in a moment um, but there's radiating golden beams behind the sculpture and they're made to look even more like they are radiating because above this is um, a clear or not clear a yellow glass pane so the Sun that was naturally coming through this um, cathedral was turned yellow the light coming from that um, okay if you look at the immaculate skill that Bernini used in emulating these textures you can see fabric skin drapery clouds wings and hair they all articulate as real tangible entities it looks like if you touch it you'll actually feel that texture uh, to the left and right of the sculpture you see the Conaro family members and um, they're actually standing in these balconies as if they're watching this drama unfold it's like a play happening right before their very eyes and so this is why I say it becomes more than just one sculpture it becomes a whole installation um, with the family that uh, paid for this artwork being included in it as well so it's almost like there's an artwork within an artwork happening here um, the entire piece has a narrative so it tells a story um, and this would definitely entice people to follow the Catholic Church um, and the counter-reformation against the Protestants um, it's an artwork that has been described as virtuous and complex and at the time it would have been very difficult to ignore let alone forget um, so Bernini really did achieve his goal here in the next episode we'll be looking at the artist Caravaggio who lived a very interesting life so please be sure to tune in.